So um, just some quick opening comments on what cultural ecosystem services are and uh, why we're here today. So this topic is one of the five focus areas of the Science Collaborative. Projects in this focus area explore the ways an ecosystem service approach and human dimensions research can be utilized to support the protection and restoration of estuarine systems. And this responds to a priority to the reserve system to better understand and communicate the different values provided by estuarine systems. Over the last year, this Catalyst project team partnered with reserve staff and community organizations at the Heia Reserve in Hawaii and the Kachemak Bay Reserve in Alaska to enhance estuary stewardship and management by deepening the application of cultural ecosystem services to weave practices in contemporary ecological restoration together with indigenous and local knowledge and place-based stewardship techniques. You'll hear from three members of the project team shortly, but before we get started, I have a quick intro to the reserve system and the science collaborative and this webinar series. So let me share slides again because I think I'm not sharing slides at the moment because that is what happens when your internet disconnects. Okay. So here's the fun slide with the reserve map. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is a national network of unique research reserves as shown on this map. This is a NOAA program that works in collaboration with a local place-based partner, either a state agency, university, or nonprofit. Each reserve site includes programs focused on land stewardship, research and scientific monitoring, training programs for the public and local officials, and education. The Science Collaborative supports science for estuarine and coastal decision makers by coordinating regular funding opportunities and supporting user-driven collaborative research, assessment, and transfer activities that address critical coastal management needs identified by the reserves. This webinar series features project teams supported by the Science Collaborative, program staff, and partners. Speakers share their unique approaches to addressing current coastal and estuarine management need issues. And if that sounds interesting to you, please join us for future webinars to learn about new methods to integrate technical experts and users of project outputs into the research process and how the research results and products might inform your own work. So today, we are in Zoom today, so attendees are muted on entry and we'll handle questions via the Q&A feature, but chat is also enabled, which means it's visible to everybody, so best behavior everybody, but you can chat amongst yourselves. So uh, you can ask questions via the Q&A feature, we encourage you to just type them in there as they occur to you so they don't get lost or forgotten and chat's visible to everyone, like I said, so you can also use it to ask us uh, technical questions if you have a technical issue, you can just chat myself or one of the other organizers for today's session. So with that, I'd like to welcome our speakers for today's webinar. Pua Alapiskua is a program coordinator with the Hawaii Conservation Alliance Foundation and served as the PI for this project. Eleanor Sterling is the director of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii Manoa with the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. And Rachel Dax is a researcher at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii Manoa as well. And with that, I believe I'm passing it to Pua Ala so I can mercifully get out of the way before my internet decides to pull anything else. So Pua Ala, I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks, Nick, and no trouble at all. We just roll with it. We just roll with it. That's right. <laughs> the virtual world is unforgiving and unpredictable. All yours. Take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Aloha. Um, very warm greetings to you all. Thank you for taking some time today to share this space with us. Uh, before I get started, I did see in the Q&A that we might be having a hiccup with the open chat function, and we do have an icebreaker question that'll come up in about five minutes. So I might invite our guests to, if you have the option, send your chat to the panelist drop-down option um, or other drop-down that lets your messages come to us. Um, and we will do our best to call those things out verbally so that we can share them with you all. Um, and again, welcome. Today we'll be talking about our um, 2020 Catalyst project, which was um, recently wrapped up I say recently because we did delay the start of this project due to COVID adaptations. And again, today we'll be fo focusing on cultural ecosystem services and estuary stewardship and management. I'm Pua Ala, joined today by my colleagues Eleanor and Rachel. And with that, I will invite them to disable video and we will hop right into this. So, as I alluded to a second ago, we invite you all to join this as in a, as much participation as we can in a webinar format at least to to ask you to drop in that chat what comes to mind when you think about all the ways you relate to interact with and are sustained by the environment in the place you call home so take a second to think on that and please do send in your responses if you are comfortable doing so when you are ready doing so and we'll circle back to those in a second um, 
we we couldn't do this project any justice without calling out all the individuals and organizations who have made this work possible. In particular, our partner reserves in Heeya and Ketchamak Bay, together with staff at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, the American Museum of Natural History, Center for Biodiversity and Conservation, uh, and my home organization now, the Hawaii Conservation Alliance Foundation. So these are a few of the many faces who have made this work possible and a big, big, big mahalo to all the individuals and orgs um, who helped us to advance this work and continue to do so. All right, so you may have heard the terminology, the term rather ecosystem services, which is one tool, one approach to help us characterize the diverse suite of benefits that humans receive through their interactions with the environment. Uh, you may know that ecosystem services have kind of four core areas, um, including supporting services, provisioning services, regulating services, but also this last category here, cultural services. Um, as you can see, cultural ecosystem services are embedded as one of the four core components included in an ecosystem service assessment. But we also know that for a variety of reasons, which we'll elaborate upon shortly, uh, cultural ecosystem services may not be represented or articulated as often as these other three. In response to this, we did this deep dive project. Um, you know, we looking across the kind of depth and breadth of this one year project, we thought really hard on ways we might be able to articulate in this webinar some really key takeaways that we want you to walk away with. So here I'll mention that across the various products that you'll hear about today and that are available on our website, we do have some very detailed um, descriptions of different definitions of cultural ecosystem services together with categories of services that people have used, also case study examples of um, studies, projects, et cetera, that have kind of detailed cultural ecosystem services in their area. But for you today, I think our take home is that, you know, cultural ecosystem services distilled down are really the many ways that the environment contributes to human well-being. Uh, for instance, through experiences, through connections to place, connections to people, through providing sustenance in all its forms, um, through fostering relationships, and, and a lot of different connections that you'll hear about shortly. So here, we, I think we want to pause and take a peek at what's coming in in the chat. What did you folks answer? Oh, I see them now. All right. And I think I see here that a lot of your responses resonate quite well with this list. I see responses on physical and mental health, gratitude, quality of life, provision of food and water, um, peacefulness, calmness. Great. Thanks, folks. Thank you to all who have taken some time to drop a note in the chat. And please do keep those coming if you're motivated uh, to do so. And I think here I'm going to go ahead and pass to my colleague, Eleanor. Mahalo po ala. Uh, so the next slide shows that there are many ways that um, you can include cultural or many reasons why you would want to include cultural ecosystem services into your ecosystem services assessments. And some of them include the fact that um, they can help provide a fuller understanding of an ecosystem and its functioning. They can help you to actually pinpoint inequities across the communities with whom you work and then help to reduce conflict um, in the work that you're doing. They can help you work together with others in your um, community to help prioritize areas for action. They can help develop resilience and trust across those communities, deepen stewardship and management efforts, um, meet federal US federal mandates for, for NERS. And um, they also help you to reveal values, connections, relationships, and underlying uh, and motivations that are critical to include in the decision-making process. And in thinking about uh, those underlying motivations, um, sorry, I was just asked to start my video. I thought we were told not to. Um, uh, the, in thinking about those underlying motivations, uh, one of the most important things that to be thinking about are 
are the values that drive behavior, that drive why people do what they do, what they care about. And those are fundamental to the cultural ecosystem services uh, concepts. So in this graphic, we have um, a subset, I mean, a, um, a take from the recent intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services assessment of the various values of biodiversity. And in the top part of the graphic, you see that there are really deep um, value systems, worldviews, knowledge systems, um, whether you focus in on the anthropocentric or um, uh, in, um, other ways of, of knowing about the environment and the places where, where humans fit within the environment. There are also broad values, the guiding principles, whether you care about prosperity and livelihoods or whether you care about kin, about other organisms being your kin. There are also specific values and then value indicators. And the value indicators are really fundamental for thinking about cultural ecosystem services because those are the things that you at the NERS level are, man are, are um, measuring to be able to reflect these different values and what, what people care about. So in the viewpoint that one, um, one way of looking at it is that there are a set of ways that people measure what they value by thinking about living from the nature. So the living from nature is essentially um, measuring how much money you make when when you're taking tourists out or how much uh, the market value of fish, for instance. Um, living in is perhaps the physiological benefits you get from being a part of nature. And we saw a lot of those in, um, in the chat today. Living with uh, is perhaps um, thinking about the, the existence value of fish or the legal standing of fish and recognizing the importance of harmonizing our relationships with organisms around us and caring for them. And living as is recognizing that in many places around the world, uh, communities recognize that they are kin with other organisms and that you might be actually be measuring references to personhood for a fish um, or the health of the fish, nutrition of the fish, not necessarily what it can do for us as humans. So next slide. Um, we also want to mention that the, the, the what we're presenting here results from work we've done um, to basically look across the world and in particular within NERS uh, of how people have been using the term cultural ecosystem services, employing these ideas so that we can gain inspiration from what's been happening around the world. But one thing we wanted to share too is that there are lots of ways that you all are doing this already, even if you're not using the term cultural ecosystem services. Um, some people are using other phrases that overlap with um, what, uh, what is called cultural ecosystem services. Those might include human dimensions of ecosystems, connections to place, place-based community interactions, connectedness to nature, or something that really thinks about the reciprocal relationship with place. Next. So we took a very interdisciplinary approach with our project. And the first uh, piece of the work that we did was to develop a synthesis of existing concepts and practice, as I mentioned. And we've presented that in the past to you all. Um, and they're also available on the website. And we'll, we'll share that towards the end. But these resulted in technical summaries of key methods and key recommendations. Uh, for different audiences. And so those are available to you now and will be available. Um, and some are available now and some will be available, available in the next month. We also did um, site-based work to advance that practical application. So not just thinking about what are the concepts and where people have done it elsewhere, but how can we apply it in our work and sp specific with um, reserve exchanges in person. And then we have started to co-design and co-produce a suite of deliverables for broader audiences that think about um, implementation, um, evaluation, and sort of guidelines or recommendations for what we learned from our um, applications. And here I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, and I think I started the video snafu that's deviating from our plan, but I will enable my video here to hop back in and just reiterate, you know, in trying to think about the group that we saw in the registration list for today's webinar, and also thinking about the diversity of products that we've shared about previously or are currently available on our project play page. Today, again, we want to take a focus on sharing out with you some lessons we learned along the way that may not be as strongly articulated in our products as some of the other core content um, in an effort to share things that we hope inspire action or um, advancement in your area. 
Uh, so I don't think it's news to this group that community partner engagement is it's really critical in in many, if not all reserves. Um, and while Hawaii and Alaska may seem quite geographically distinct, perhaps environmentally distinct, uh, both of our partner reserves in this Catalyst project are characterized by their really strong relationships with uh, local community partner organizations, indigenous partner organizations uh, who live, excuse me, live and work in and around the reserve. Um, in the design of this project and in partnership with NARA, uh, we were able to administer nearly $50,000 in financial support to reserve community partner organizations, nonprofit partner organizations, to really honor and respect their subject matter expertise, in particular their lived and learned local experiences um, that, that really are the cultural ecosystem services. Um, and these things are really critical, their, their experience, I should say, is really critical to advance effective estuary stewardship and restoration. Um, in our project, this financial support was a really highly valuable arrangement. And while we encourage others to really look into this, um, we also know that there may be different locally appropriate ways to equitably honor local expertise. Um, and we don't want to create a, a um, we don't want to create a recommendation that may not fit in your area, in your reserve, but we do want to encourage you to seek the different types of opportunities to honor that local subject matter expertise. Um, I also want to point out that many community partners may come from small nonprofit organizations who sometimes have significantly less organizational or administrative support um, than some of our home institutions that have divisions that do contracts and all of that stuff and it's it can be really easy to overlook that in your um, relationship processes with these non partners. Um, so I encourage you to again be attentive to the needs and processes that may exist in those small nonprofits and be prepared to be flexible and adaptive as may be needed. Uh, finally, on this slide, at least I think it's really critical to point out that. Um, food sharing cultural foods themselves and food sharing is a really highly integral component of many local gatherings, especially so among uh, indigenous communities. And while we know that federal funding sources have limitations, constraints around this particular type of spending, uh, we do really highly encourage folks on this call today to try and look into ways to leverage existing funding or other funding sources to ensure that those remain critical components of your engagement uh, processes. Yes. Next slide. All right, here I would love to bring in some of the voices, faces, um, mana of the community partners that we worked with in Heia, in particular the organizations you see here, Pai Pai O Heia, Kaka'o, Yivi, Ko'olau, Poka Hawaiian Civic Club, and the Ko'olau Foundation. Uh, these small nonprofit organization groups care for nearshore wetland and upland environments uh, with a collective focus on wetland stewardship, intergenerational practice, and civic engagement. In Ketchumak Bay, we had the privilege of working with partners at the Ketchumak Heritage Land Trust, Ninochik Traditional Council, and Homer Council on the Arts. Together, these groups um, work collectively on land conservation, the perpetuation of community well being cultural and cultural practices, and the appreciation for and accessibility of the arts. All right, hopefully that spurred some action, some motivation in you all. Yes, we are excited. We want to do more community engagement. Um, wonderful. With that, I would remind you um, things that I suggested along the way that, you know, these are our experiences we're sharing here within these two partner reserves. And we really highly encourage you to take a place-centered, locally centered adaptive approach that meets your needs, your partner's needs. Um, and we'd also like to point out that in our experience, when and how you engage your partners are shaped by a variety of factors, perhaps including things like your reserve size. If, uh, for example, um, one significant logistical planning piece is that our partners in Ketchumak often needed to travel in Homer by plane or boat to get to their meeting, which is not necessarily something that happens as much in the Heia Reserve. Um, 
and not including those types of transportation related support needs in your planning budget could be really detrimental right to the structure and format of your engagement. Um, another example from the list you see here is that kind of thinking about when you engage partners or also how um, recently about two weeks ago we were able to convene a family day in Heia. Uh, a lot of the stewardship organizations that I listed out earlier in Heia, you know, they're so active in their stewardship efforts that they very rarely have time to come together across orgs um, if it's not like a one hour Zoom meeting. So through that family day format um, depicted in this picture here, you know, we created a really um, leisurely, casual, enjoyable maybe setting for those partners to come together um, and talk to each other and talk about the work that they're doing in a non structured format and really just enjoy space together. Just some examples that hopefully inspire action in your place in your work and with that, let me pass to my colleague Rachel. Mahalo po Allah. Okay. So um, Eleanor mentioned in um, the list of things that this pro uh, project produced, um, she mentioned that one of them was this methods pilot. And so I'm gonna be talking about that. Um, so in the next couple of slides, I'll elaborate on a couple of methods that we piloted during two exchanges. Um, so one of those exchanges was in Heia and one in Kachmak Bay. So in Heia, we tested um, some of these methods amongst in like kind of a, a comfortable space um, that consisted of nurse staff, um, project members from each site, um, and then the nurse staff, nurse staff from both from both sites, sorry. And then in Ketchmack Bay, we, we practiced some of these methods um, <clears throat> as part of an event that followed a nurse council meeting. So I'll only touch upon um, four methods, but we, we trialed and piloted um, several more. Um, but you can find more information on our experiences with the methods I'll mention, but also additional methods um, in the methods piloting summary report, which Pu'ala will direct you to at the end of um, this presentation. So in the report, specifically, uh, if you do read through, you'll, you'll see um, uh, what, what we um, discussed kind of after the pilot. So what the method is good for, what time and materials may be needed for that method, the potential strengths and challenges, um, and then where these methods could be used specifically in the NERS system, so potential application in the NERS. Um, but I do wanna remind you, as you read through this report, you'll read um, our kind of thoughts and discussion of these methods based on our own experiences. And these experiences are in the context of our own reserves. So you all know that each reserve is highly unique and there are many potential different uses for these methods. Um, so a reserve's experience with each method is expected to be highly variable, but we wanted to share our experiences to really give kind of a, um, an on the ground example of how these methods might look. Um, and I do wanna remind you as I report on these methods um, and you may be thinking how you might be interested in using them, <clears throat> that something that we really um, came across, we didn't ex really think about this as from the beginning of the project. At the beginning of the project, we really wanted to explore methods that could be used for identifying or assessing cultural ecosystem services. But kind of as we were piloting these, these methods, we realized that they're really great uh, approaches for, for building or strengthening relationships either with our partners or um, different uh, parts of the community. So keep that in mind as you think about how you may be able to use some of these methods. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so the first method I'll talk about, um, participant observation. Um, this uh, pilot occurred in Heia. So on one of the mornings of the exchanges, we all attended a service learning event at one of the Heia NER partner sites. Um, we spent the morning alongside staff of that nonprofit organization, um, working to pile non-native invasive mangrove wood that had been cut so it could be later burned to make room for restoration and uh, make room for native species. So the participants in the methods pilot um, they were instructed to engage in the workday as they were instructed, um, while being really keen observers and very good listeners, um, to really listen for um, 
mentions of cultural ecosystem services so we could better understand what cultural ecosystem services the different staff of that organization um, were experiencing in their work. Um, and we did have a couple of guiding questions that we provided um, the piloting participants, but we didn't want them to ask them explicitly. We, we wanted to them for listen to how responses may have come up naturally in conversation as they worked. Um, and so then after each method that we piloted, we, we debriefed. Um, and so for this method, the group thought it was really valuable for allowing for spontaneity. Um, they thought it felt less formal and less extractive than other, other methods that we piloted. Um, and they also thought this method was good for better understanding the context of CES, um, specifically, you know, where, where community or partner um, organizations are experiencing the CES, the smells, the sights, the, the sounds too associated with these different um, cultural ecosystem services. And they thought that this method could easily be added to um, existing community engagement that's already occurring in, in the different areas. Next slide, please. So after attending the workday, we piloted a different method, a creative writing method. Um, for this method, the participants were instructed to compose a poem using whatever format they wanted. Um, however, in composing the poem, we, we asked them to um, have their poems be centered on how they felt about the morning's work. Um, uh, in Haiti. And so the image that's shown on the slide is one example of the product. So in this poem, the writer brought in human and non-human perspectives in discussing the restoration activities and the curiosity of Jackson, uh, a chameleon. Um, when we piloted this, this method, um, after we, we wrote, after we composed our poems, we then swapped them with another participant and read their poems. And then we analyzed the poems for broad themes that arose, so some qualitative data analysis there. Um, we felt that this method was particularly effective at gaining insight on the feelings and perspectives of individuals, but this method, like all of our methods actually, may not be appropriate for all audiences. We need the right kind of the right setting and the right participants to engage in this um, creative writing uh, method. Some of our participants that work in the education sector felt that um, this method could be really um, useful and one that they may adopt for their work with teachers and students. Um, and besides the qualitative da data analysis that we did on this poem to kind of understand what cultural ecosystem services participants were, um, were experiencing, we actually sent this poem to our host um, for that restoration activity that morning. Um, as kind of a thank you. And this really highlights, um, again, one way that these methods could be used for building or strengthening relationships, right? If by sharing these poems or sharing whatever products of, of CES methods that, that may result. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving to Kachmak Bainer here um, for uh, transect walks. So Transect, walk, transect walks were another method we piloted. Sometimes these are also known as oral transects. Um, and these transect walks are similar to transects that are used in ecological studies um, in that we travel along a, a specific path or area. Um, the big difference is that in a transect walk or an oral transect, the focus is on hearing about that place through communicating and not necessarily measuring any specific element along the way. Um, I also wanna point out that transect, transect walks don't have to be actual walks. Um, when we piloted this method in Haitiya, we didn't walk, we actually rode a boat um, and then did a snorkel. Um, so the picture that you see though is from um, an existing program in Kachmak Bay Nur called Fish Need Land 2. Um, and this is a program that was kind of already using this method a bit. And so in this program, the NUR organizes trips inland that are at quite a distance from large bodies of water. Um, and they look for baby salmon in these small, pretty much puddles um, that are sometimes even along roads, right? And so the participants in these programs know, know the places where we're going. They know these sites well yet are somewhat surprised to see um, the fish that come up in these, in these puddles that are so far in that. Um, so in these programs, there's of course discussion about baby salmon, ecology, impacts on salmon, et cetera. 
Um, but then there's this really rich discussion. And so the trip that um, Eleanor and I attended when we did the exchange um, in Ketchmuck Bay, we witnessed this firsthand. So um, after we did um, the walk to the site, looked for some baby fish, talked about salmon, we spent quite a while um, um, just kind of in this casual, um, informal discussion. Um, and this discussion included rich information about the history of this place um, and other personal reflections that the attendees um, communicated. Um, and so when we debriefed about this, this method in Heiia, we thought that it was really valuable for being open-ended, similar to the participant observation. And it really can help to identify overlaps and disconnects between values and priorities of the reserve um, and those values and priorities of surrounding communities. And that, we witnessed this again firsthand in Ketchmack. So one of the community members that attended the, the trip um, pointed out that we all have a common goal um, of wanting salmon. We all want salmon, but how we get there may be different. So conservationists or natural resource managers may have different steps along the way than, than folks in the community for the shared goal of having salmon. Next slide, please. So then um, finally, the last uh, math type of method that I'll, I'll share um, were these art-based, visual art-based methods. And um, we practiced this method in Hatchback Boehner um, as part of kind of this after event to an our council meeting. Um, and we tried two different methods. So the one, on you, the one that you see on the left in, involved just really piling acrylic paints into a little plastic cup and then pouring them across a canvas. And each color, so as, as participants kind of plopped this paint into their cups, um, uh, the organizers explained that each color represented a different element of the watershed. So for example, one color was glacial water, one was ocean, one peat, alder trees, oxygen, different minerals, et cetera. Um, and so participants could create their personalized watershed um, based on their values and their preferences for what they wanted in that watershed. Um, and in explaining what each color represents, there is an opportunity to discuss the cultural ecosystem services of that element. Um, and so in the second method, you'll see that picture on the right, participants are painting on silk. Um, before beginning to paint, participants were instructed to compose a a short one line poem um, and then write it on their silk and then that poem would guide what they painted on their on their piece of silk. Um, and so this activity involved both creative writing and um, visual art. And so after participants paint, um, they can then discuss um, their poem and their and their painting um, and, the, and the cultural ecosystem services that that it touches upon. I also wanted to point out that this activity actually was led and hosted by the Homer Council on the Arts. Um, so again, a really great opportunity to strengthen or build relationships between partners in the um, And I also wanted to mention the, the products of these two art-based methods were amazing. Um, and I can't say that anyone in the group besides the, the host um, really had any um, artistic ability necessarily. So these are super accessible methods. All the products, all the pieces that um, were created were really, really amazing. And I think many participants came in thinking, oh, mine is going to be horrible. I'm not an artist. But they were really, really beautiful. And I think I'll pass it on to Paula. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so I that that kind of wraps up some of the methods we wanted to highlight for you all today, just to give you a glimpse into some of the things we tried on together um, to better understand what do these tools, these assessment, these engagement tools look like in practice. Um, and here I'll kind of pivot back again to our higher level lessons learned, take home messages that we want to share with you all around the broader breadth and depth of the project. And I'll also point out that you may have seen in the title slide, this project proposal was constructed pre-pandemic um, and had pretty extensive plans for in-person gatherings, travel, exchange. Uh, we did delay the project maybe twice <laughs> because we knew that in our partner reserves, there wasn't really an equal substitute to in-person gathering. And as we all know, that hasn't been as possible these past few years. 
Uh, that said, we are really grateful for the valuable tool that is virtual engagement and know that that works really well oftentimes in many, many settings. Uh, we're also super grateful that our COVID adaptive project work plan allowed for some travel, including that small group that came to Hi'eia to pilot these methods and sending two of our project members to Kechimak Bay um, this calendar year. Through implementing these in-person kind of place focused, happening within the reserve with our partners, um, these exchanges really underscored the importance of learning together in place to draw from and build upon existing skill sets. Uh, one of our reserve exchange participants in He'eia called it kind of facilitated vulnerability. Um, trying these things out that maybe might cause a little bit of discomfort, but doing so in a safe setting where we're all learning together, um, that's something that's really hard to duplicate uh, effectively in the virtual world. Um, coming together in person, in place also offers a unique opportunity to broaden perspectives and understandings of the unique context in which we work. Uh, as Rachel kind of pointed out in the participant observation exchange, you know, talking about non-native species control is one thing, but actually being there, experiencing it, seeing what's happening, it kind of adds a whole different level to your understanding of the context and also your understanding of the cultural ecosystem services that are prominent in an area. Um, finally, I'm a firm believer that coming together in person offers a level of sharing and comparing lessons learned that that may not happen um, in kind of structured or condensed time frames, as is often the case in um, shorter meetings. All right. So again, in this webinar, we kind of struggled with, you know, we have these solid products that we would love to detail and outline with you all today, but we also thought those take home messages that we shared along the way were really critical and maybe not as clearly articulated in the products, but I will say the products are so awesome. So to kind of group them by um, the diverse needs we've kind of seen and encountered along the way, if you're a casual browsing kind of person, there's a really cool blog post that we worked on with Nara available at the hyperlink you see there, and we might be able to drop that in the chat for you all as well. Um, we also have a project overview video that happened kind of at the beginning of the project, just a five minute video that details a lot more of the background that I skimmed over earlier. What are some of the definitions we've been hearing? What's some of the conceptual foundations of this work? Um, and then we distilled a bunch of um, products for introductory learners, folks who are excited maybe by the things that you're hearing today and just wanna learn um, a lot more about when, how, what. Um, we have a series of informational brochures, a background primer, if you will, available on our project page. We also have some really cool compilations of common frameworks um, that others have used to conceptualize, articulate cultural ecosystem services and the categories used in those frameworks. Um, the compilation of case studies is something I mentioned earlier in our synthesis of literature of examples. We tried to call out these, these consolidated examples of how cultural ecosystem services were assessed, evaluated elsewhere again, as a perhaps source of inspiration, of guidance for others. And then we have a set of deliverables, which are forthcoming, um, that are really intended to inform, inform advanced application. We recognize that at least a few of you on the call today do already have strong foundations in this work and are um, hungry for um, information on ways to deepen or expand your existing efforts. So we do have a summary of, a full summary of the methods pilot that Rachel shared out today that include additional methods um, and key takeaways for our uh, lessons learned in trying out some of those methods. Uh, we have a white paper that stems from our synthesis of all of it, much of the available information on cultural ecosystem services, how it's defined, how it's been implemented. Um, and that white paper will also be reformatted and expanded as a peer reviewed journal article. Um, we anticipate the methods pilot summary report and white paper will be available this fall, so please do check out our project page at a later date if you are interested in um, seeing that work. And I see a note in the chat that recording of this session will also be available for you all in the future. Um, this was a one year catalyst project and you know 
True to its name, the intention of the catalyst is to catalyze future action, impacts, outcomes. To outline some of the cool things that we've seen thus far is that, you know, it's been really important and exciting to see the reserve staff that we interact with, seeing themselves in this work. Um, in 2021, we hosted a cross-sector sharing session at the annual meeting where we use these small breakout groups to encourage participants to talk to one another and really to create a space where they could acknowledge that the skills and efforts necessary to implement cultural ecosystem service work of any kind are kind of underway. You know, they're happening um, in different ways, in different places, and sometimes using different words. But at their core, um, really it's it's a foundation of understanding how human dimensions how different values benefits how those coalesce in our reserves and and contribute to the well-being of the people who live work um, and otherwise interact with the reserves uh, we saw a lot of relationship building happening which i think is also a critical component of this work uh, in Heia, the family day that i talked about um, happened just a few weeks ago and to the best of my knowledge, that type of format of a gathering in that particular place, Mokuolo'e, maybe haven't, hadn't happened for something like over 20 years. And trying to think through new and exciting ways to build relationships in place is always an area of interest for me. Um, but I'm glad that it's something that we can share with you all today to again, perhaps inspire advanced um, expansion, advancement in your efforts. I already talked about the toolbox of engagement and assessment methods that are some of the products that resulted through this work. Um, and also we, we're seeing some pretty strong initial steps toward developing a shared language um, around cultural ecosystem services and cultural ecosystem service type work happening at the individual reserve level, the system level and the agency level, um, which leads me to this next slide. For us, catalyzing further action around this topic is gonna happen in a couple different ways including an expansion of this work. But for now, I'll share that there were pretty significant synergies and resonance. And when I say that, I mean um, similar interests or overlapping efforts to deepen stewardship and management through a strong focus on human dimensions, cultural values, and various pathways to uh, advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. Um, Here's a list of some of the groups that we interacted with and exchanged with throughout the course of the one year project. Um, at least one of our engagement, broader engagement with the system through the cross sector session, uh, we think encouraged the inclusion of cultural values in our RFP um, focused on enhancing the inclusion of cultural values across the national um, NOS level. Um, and increasingly we're working with groups to make sure that that sort of cultural value lens is also included in proposal evaluations, how these future proposals are crafted and how they're evaluated in terms of their um, place based benefits community level benefits broader network benefits. Um, finally, I think i'll point out here that some of you folks may be on the call, but we were invited to participate in a group where we shared and compared examples of questions that can be used to assess cultural values. Um, toward informing the creation of a combined question bank list that would be pre approved by OMB, thus making it easier for folks like you on the ground to implement on a more immediate time scale. So please do be on the lookout for that question bank list um, as approval permits. Um, but thank you again to that group for leading that effort. With that, I'll pass to my colleague Rachel to please elaborate on the expansion of this work. Hello, Pu'ala. So just like um, Pu'ala just said, the Catalyst project really did serve its purpose to spark um, interest and activity in around CES. Um, and we're excited that we're also, uh, we um, are going to be doing a science transfer that kind of follows up with this work. So reciprocal relationship, relationships and reserves, establishing a community of practitioners for identifying and using cultural ecosystem services approaches. So the top four, um, reserves um, were reserves that signed on to be the core group to lead this work um, to extend CES work to additional reserves um, through the creation of a community of practice. Um, and the three reserves on the bottom are interested in joining this 
community of practices cohort. Um, and there are others I'm sure that are interested. So the cohort will involve three workshops with several surrounding follow-up meetings that um, where we can brief each other on that work that's actually being done on the ground. If you wanna learn more about this, feel free to get in touch or we will be holding um, a cross-sector um, session at the annual meeting on method methodological approaches for exploring cultural ecosystem services, which will tell you a little bit more about the science transfer as well. Mahalo. Thanks. And with that, we'd like to close today's presentation by thanking you all again for taking the time today to come by. Um, all of our materials to date and future materials will be made available at the science uh, collaborative project page you see there, also dropped in the chat. Um, those are our contact emails and massive thanks again to the Science Collaborative for creating the opportunity to explore this work. Thank you to our partner reserves and thank you to our home institutions who have supported us along the way. Um, thank you. With that, I think we have about a little less than 10 minutes for Q&A. If we have any coming in, please feel free to drop any questions you may have in the chat and I will pause and pass to our host. Thanks, folks. Great work. Um, I guess we can kill the screen share here. And I see at least one question. So uh, you can see the Q&A too as well, right? All right. Well, you don't really need me for this part then. So I'm just going to stay out of the way still. <laughs> Have at it. Keep them coming, folks. Lots of, lots of potential for questions here. So I have 10 minutes roughly. Thanks, Kristen, for that question. And for those who may not see it um, for the recording, the question is, uh, thanks so much for the pre presentation. Amazing work, y'all. Thanks, Kristen. I'm wondering if you can share more about what you were learning about how to consider and communicate about ecosystem services beyond or in addition to the anthropocentric, anthrop anthropocentric lens, bio-ecocentric and pluricentric. So um, I think if I understand correctly, what you're asking is um, what what kind of other types of specific values should we be thinking about, given that those um, anthropocentric, biocentric, and pluricentric are very based and sometimes hard to change? Um, they do change um, in some people through time, but they're they're very um, deeply held. And so when I talk to people about um, values, I try to work with the things that are closer to how they they're making decisions, and Aaron, I think, and a couple of people in the in the um, chat were saying that they that um, cultural ecosystem services affect them in so many ways, and being in a particular environment affects them in so in so many ways that they don't even know about that it, you sort of forget sometimes to be aware of those. But what we try to do is raise awareness about those things by really focusing in on what's happening with people. And some of the methods that Rachel was talking about are ways to, to start to bring up these connections and these relationships that people value, appreciate, and actually make decisions based on, but they're not really thinking about it. So some of what we try to do is just bring them to the fore and we try not to use the academic language about them, but really just focus in on actions, behaviors, and then tie them to some of these underlying values, these, um, the ways that relations are happening in a place, a sense of place in a fishing community, um, the um, health benefits of recreation, and really basically trying to bring those specific values to the fore in language that's not academic. Does that help, Kristen, or is there another, I, I don't know if you can, um, ask questions directly or if we just need to be communicating back and forth with written and then verbal or Rachel and Pua'ala do you have other ways to answer the question that Christian posed or Kristen posed I think I'd, I'll try and hop in with one quick example that I'm trying to see I was trying to think of an example that may resonate across places um, but one thing that comes to the front of my mind is kind of this life ways livelihoods category of benefits that we often see and you know livelihood can be perceived through the lens of economic benefits right you are provided for monetarily so that you can have a certain quality of life but if your livelihood kind of centers on local practices like fishing farming um, other ways of maintaining these really strong connections to a place through your activity in that place even outreach education is an example um, 
but you're being provided for in so many more ways, right? Through being there, through experiencing a place over seasons, through the interactions you have with people in a place. Um, and so I guess for us, it's important to try and identify the multiple layers that may be encompassed when you ask somebody the ways that they interact or benefit from a place. They might say livelihood and one side, the economic side might say, okay, income, jobs, all of that. But if you dig more through some of the methods that we just shared about today, I think it's easier to illuminate the layered and multidimensional facets that contribute to um, well-being. Rachel, anything from you? Yeah, I had a quick concrete example. So another project I'm involved in um, is, is looking at um, kind of like a systems mapping approach to understand relationships um, between humans and oceans. But the guiding question, we specifically didn't want it to be anthropocentric. So uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but it has something like what enables or what helps or hinders island living things relationships with the ocean. So we weren't specific to human, right? So because we don't want to just hear um, necessarily what is helping humans access oceans, right? We want to know all the different relationships. So we, we tried to steer away from the human or people um, words. Um, and I think another example, Eleanor and Paul Ella and I have all been involved in a, um, a learning cohort, which, which refers to other living things as people too. So the plant people and the fish people. Um, and by, by using that kind of people word to acknowledge that they are also living sentient beings, um, that kind of, I think, shifts the focus from an uh, anthropogenic model. So those are two concrete examples I could think of. Mahalo. Thanks for that question, Kristen. Um, but I see another question that came in from Deanna. Thanks for the question, Deanna. Um, so how important is it to be comprehensive of all CES in a place? And, and are the methods that we presented, can they do that or do they do that? Great question. Um, in the report, we touch a little upon this. We, we, as a group, we kind of tried to focus on what types of CES um, these different methods did capture. Um, and I think it's important probably to use more than one method with the same group, but each group may need to have, I mean, depending on whether it's a partner or community group or, or, or whatever, you, you really need to think about which method is, which set of methods, I should say, is best in order to kind of have the methods complement each other. And Paula and Eleanor, please um, chime in if you have other thoughts too. Yeah, I think in any situation you're in where you're trying to figure out what to measure and what not to measure and how much work to put into measuring versus doing, um, you know, that's what you face with biological as well as um, these cultural um, issues and what you need to just work with um, the important members of your community to figure out is what are the most important values and what are you missing? if you're just measuring the ones that are easily measurable, that are the ones that have tended to be measured in the past, and are those things that are missing things that are actually driving behavior, driving people to act in ways you want or don't want for effective stewardship and maintenance of these, these connections and the goals of your, of your reserve. So um, I think that we've been finding through the work that we've been doing that there are a lot of places that tend to focus in on the easily measurable, but potentially less important. Um, factors because they want something standardized or they want something that they can do relatively easily, but they're missing things that are really driving important um, important parts of the system, important behaviors that potentially just need to be managed better to meet the goals of the NER. Really quickly, I wanted to add that some of the methods that I mentioned would be used in order to develop other methods, right? You might do a transect walk or some participant observation in order to figure out what questions you might want to put into a survey, right? If you decide to use a survey or what questions to pose in a focus group. So they have to be done in combination sometimes. And then I'll attempt to pick up this one last question and then pass to Nick to wrap us up for today. Um, question is, uh, where any of the piloted methods co-created with the communities is that done in this type of work? The answer is it is absolutely done. Um, that said, we uh, in our notes 
mentioned meant to tell you but maybe didn't tell you in the presentation that you know coming into this project we had this really strong plan that we were going to pilot all the methods with our community partners and then realize through initial listening sessions which again are critically important to include in your project that you know maybe the partner relationships weren't at the right place to come in with um, a suite of methods to try together and in that light the co-creation kind of happened by adapting our pathway to um, take their cues about how they want to tell us about things in place so it changed the engagement if you will that's that's what co um, created the method there is co-creating the engagement strategy um, a lot of the methods like the art-based component were informed by community partner organizations um, and their existing work, for example, Homer Council on the Arts. Um, but I think co-creation of methods and approaches happens at multiple scales and levels in projects like these, and we are fully supportive of all of it, um, but again, done so in a way that meets the needs of your place. And we hope that some of that co-creation of the me these methods occurs in the science transfer project. So I think that's the next step. Thanks for that question. Thanks. Anything else from my co-presenters today? All right. And if none, I will pass back to you, Nick. Thank you so much. That was great. And I feel very energized and excited about this work. So I'm excited to see where it goes next as well. And uh, everybody who joined today, thank you for joining and spending some time with us. And as always, the recording will be available within a few days. I know somebody asked that question in the chat, so I'll just reiterate it. Usually takes us, you know, one to three days somewhere in that time frame to edit a video and post it. So it'll be available on the YouTube channel and on the um, Science Collaborative site as well. So keep an eye out for those. Um, but of course, there will also be a follow-up email that goes out automatically. So if you signed up for today's session, you'll see it. Uh, last thing as we wrap up is our next webinar is next month on October 12th from 2 p.m. Eastern to 3 p.m. Eastern, and that will be Andrew Tweel presenting on uh, Piping Clover. So join us for that as well. Keep an eye out for announcements. Thanks to our panelists for joining us today and putting together a great presentation, and everyone have a great day.